ahead and turn in your Bibles to the book of Ruth. We began this study this morning. It's really, it's a short book, but it's a powerful book. It's in the history section of our Bibles. The book gives us a life, basically, of a Moabite girl. And we'll talk about who the Moabites were in just a little bit. Her name is Ruth. She comes to trust in the God of Israel. And she becomes an example of courage and faithfulness. The book of Ruth is the book, really, uh, of, of the two books in the Bible named for women. Esther is the story of a Jewish girl who marries a Gentile, and Ruth is the story of a Gentile girl who marries a Jewish person. As we look at this book this morning, we're going to pray in just a second. As we look at this book, we see love and redemption. Let me remind you, first of all, we see love. We see this younger woman who loves her mother-in-law. And then we see this woman who loves this man. And then we see this man who loves this woman. But we also see throughout the whole thing, God's love for us. Second is we see redemption. As we go through this book, we see redemption. And there's going to be uh, some things in the book that are Jewish and that we don't, we don't normally think about them. But if you knew the Jewish culture, you'd say, oh, I know what that is. And we're going to see something called a kinsman redeemer in which Boaz redeems. And that's a picture of Jesus redeeming us. So as we go through the book, passage by passage, it won't take us very long, only about six weeks, we're going to see aspects of Jewish life. Let me show you some things. We're going to see something called gleaning in the fields. We're going to see that Ruth just goes into somebody else's field and starts getting their stuff. We go, wait a minute, wait a minute, that's not your field. You can't just go into somebody's field, could she? We're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about what's called the Leverett Law of Marriage. That's kind of a funny word, but do you know what that is? You realize that if, if you had an older brother, you're the younger brother, and your older brother got married, and then he died, and they had no children, and you weren't married, you had to marry her and bring up a child. That's called the Leverett Law of Marriage. It's in this book. We'll talk about it. And then we'll see this kinsman Redeemer. What does that mean? Why is it called kinsman? What's redeemer? How does it fit? We're going to see how all this fits together. But the key of the whole book is the sovereignty of God who loves us and works in all the events of our lives. May we gain from our study of the book of Ruth. Let's start with prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what a great morning. Thank you for the privilege we have of coming together with fellow believers to worship Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for the Bible, especially the Old Testament, because we know that the things that were written in the Old Testament were written for our instructions. And so, Lord, we ask you that as we study the book of Ruth, as we see this Moabite girl, as we see Boaz, as we see Naomi and all of these things, that you will teach us and that we'll see truths and principles that we can apply in our lives. In fact, we can see the foreshadow of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you for the Bible, how perfect it is. Thank you for Jesus and salvation. And Lord, we just ask you now, as we study, you would teach us. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I think one of the most powerful words that we have in our language is the word love. And when you think about love, you think of commitment, you think of feelings, you think of desires, you think of emotions, you think all of these things. Think about love for a minute. What about the love for a parent for their child? I mean, think about that love. I mean, if you're a parent, you say, hey, I'd do anything for my children. I mean, I would die for my children. You, the sacrifices that parents make. And then you think about love, a man for a woman, and a woman for a man. The commitment that they would say, we're going to live our lives together for the rest of our lives. The husband loving his wife as Christ loved the church, loving her enough to die for her. The wife loving her husband. We see love for believers, one for another. What an amazing thing that the Word of God tells us to love one another. And, and we call each other brother and sister and we love one another. And Jesus said, they will know that you're my disciples by your love one for another. But when you get down to it, the greatest picture of love is the greatest act of love is God's love for us. That God so loved the world. When you think of John 3, 16, you say, God loved us, every one of us, that he gave his only begotten son. When you look at 1 John 4, verse 8, it, I'm sorry, stay on 1 John. 1 John 4, verse 8, it talks about how that God is love. When you look at Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates his own love for us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's all love. 1 John 4, and this is love, not that we love God, but God loved us and sent his son to be the satisfactory payment for our sins. When we look at the Bible, love is the key. God loved the world. God gave his son. And when you think about biblical love, it's not emotion. 
Now, our culture, our world thinks that love is emotion. Our culture and world thinks that love is a feeling. And so you have feelings for somebody, so you love them. Then you don't have feelings for somebody, then you don't love them. Love is a commitment. Love is an action. God so loved us that he gave his son. There are feelings and emotions with love, but love is an action. Love is a commitment. God gave his son. Jesus Christ left the glories of heaven to come die for us. This is going to be the key in the book of Ruth because we're going to see love all the way through the book. We're going to see Ruth loves her mother-in-law. We're going to see Ruth loves Boaz. We're going to see Boaz loves Ruth. But we're going to see that Ruth loves the God of Israel. That here she is, a Moabite, who worshipped a God. The Moabites worshipped a God called Chemosh. You know what Chemosh was? He was this God that they burned their children up. Chemosh would have this fire connected with his idol, and sometimes they took their children and threw them in the fire to appease Chemosh. Ruth came out of that background that that was God that they were to worship. And she believed in the God of Israel and trusted in the true God. What a great love story. It's greater than just a man and a woman, but it's God's redemption for us. Ruth is an exciting book. There's some things in there that you'll go, really, I never saw that before. I never realized that. It's only four chapters. We'll see some great things. Here's what we're going to do this morning. First of all, we're going to look and get a background. We're going to see the history. We're going to see how things fit together. Not a lot of detail, but I'll give it to you. Then we're going to see the most important people of the book, get a brief overview. Then we're going to highlight some of the Jewish aspects of the book. Because if you don't know those, especially if you read chapter 1 and you don't know the Jewish aspects, you'll go, what is she saying? Why is she saying that? We don't get it. Then we're going to see the basic truths from the book. And then this morning, we'll start with verses 1, 1 through 5. Let's start with the background. Okay, the background. We have to see where the book fits in. Whenever you study the Bible, you don't don't just open something up and say, "Well, I'm going to look at First John or Jeremiah or something." We're going to look at Ruth. But where does Ruth fit in? How does this thing fit? Why is it called Ruth? Well, you remember when the Jews were in captivity in Egypt, and God raised up Moses, and they came out, and all the plagues, and they came out and they parted the Red Sea, and all of that, and then Moses led them, and then they, they messed up, and so they wandered around for 40 years, and then Moses died, and Joshua led them in, and that's when they fought the battle of Jericho, and they took the land. And we'd say, yeah, we, we know all that. Well, about that time, after they took the land, that the Jewish people, instead of beginning to trust God, keeping trusting God, they began to turn away from God. And God would let enemies come in and conquer them. And then he'd raise up mighty warriors called judges. The, Greek, the Hebrew word is sulfur team, which means warriors or leaders. And they would raise them up and they would defeat the enemy. And then everything would be okay. And then they'd go back and do the same thing. The book of Judges is this cycle of them believing God, then turning away from God, getting conquered, bringing a great victor. And, and then going back to God. That's what the book of Judges is about. The book of Ruth takes, t takes place at this time. In fact, at the book of Judges, it says at the very end that everybody did what was right in their own minds. That's our culture today. See, our culture today is everybody says, well, whatever's right for you is right for you. Now, you may say that this is what's right for you and this is what's wrong, but I don't feel that way. I feel this is right and this is wrong. So everybody in our culture today, most people would say there aren't really any rights and wrongs. Just whatever you think is right and wrong. There aren't any absolute truths. That's what most people say or a lot of people say. But Ruth takes place, I think, in the time of the judges. And in this book, and I think the next slide shows it, we're going to see a contrast between the sin and unfaithfulness of the people and Ruth and Boaz. Because we're going to meet Boaz in just a minute. Ruth is the woman, and we're going to see that she stands strong for what's right. And Boaz does too, while the rest of the culture says, we just do whatever we want to do. And that would be like you deciding that you're going to stand strong for what the Bible says, even in the midst of a culture that says anything goes. And this is what we see in the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth is named for a Moabite woman who marries a Jew. Now, ready for this? She is not a Jewish person, but she is the great-grandmother of King David, the greatest king of all of Israel's history other than Jesus. She's the great-grandmother of King David. She's not even Jewish. The greatest Jewish king of all time, other than Jesus, has a Gentile woman as his great-grandmother. This woman right here. 
There's no author given. We don't know who wrote it. We think it was written about the time, the, uh, basically, of David being the king. The theme of the book is the love of God in redemption. And we're going to see it as we go through it, and we'll explain it all, and we'll put it all together as we go. There is a word that you must know, and I will bring it out as we go through the book. It's, it's not listed this way, but there's a word in Hebrew called hesed. It's H-E-S-E-D in Hebrew. It's pronounced chesed. It has this rough guttural mark, chesed. We, got, we don't say words like that much, and the Hebrew says it that way. And it means a loyal love. It means a love that never changes. And we're going to see that God is a... He loves us with a loyal, unchanging love. Second, let's talk about some important people. Important people in the book. The first one is a woman by the name of Naomi. Her name means sweet, like sweet person. She's the mother-in-law to Ruth. She's Jewish. Uh, she leaves Bethlehem with her husband, and her husband dies, and she has two sons, and they die. And so if you say to Naomi, and by the way, we're going to see it next week, that when people call her name, they say, Hey, Naomi, which means sweet. And she says, Don't call me Naomi. Call me Myra, which means bitter. And we're going to see who this woman is, and we're going to see what she does. Second, we're going to see Ruth. She's a Gentile. She's not Jewish. She's a Moabite. And let me tell you, Moabites, I mean, truthfully, they're not that good of people, okay? And, and we're going to see her, and she marries Naomi's son. And then he dies. But we're going to see she believes in the God of Israel. And then the third guy, or the third person, that's, that's Boaz. It means strong. He's the hero. He's the hero of the book. He is a rich relative. Would you like to have a rich relative? Wouldn't you love to have a rich relative? That's my uncle. He's rich, you know. Well, Boaz is a rich relative of Naomi. And we'll talk more about it in a little bit. And he's a great man of influence and power. But he loves God. And he stands for what is right, and we're going to see what he does. And there's two things about him. I'm going to throw this out, and we'll go in more detail later. The two things we're going to learn about him, he's a kinsman redeemer. And that means he has a privilege of being somehow a relative to actually help people in his family who get into trouble. Do you know in that day and time, sometimes people got in such trouble, they lost everything, and they had to sell themselves into slavery. And a rich relative called a kinsman redeemer could come and buy them back. And we're going to see that Boaz is a kinsman redeemer. And then we're going to see he's a picture of Jesus Christ. You say, how is he a picture of Christ? Do you know what a type is in the Bible? That means it's something that happens that foreshadows Jesus. You remember the Jewish people came out of Egypt. They killed a lamb. They killed a Passover lamb. And they put the blood on the door. And they were delivered from the bondage of Egypt. That Passover lamb was a type of Christ. It was a foreshadow of Jesus. Because when Jesus came, he came as the Lamb of God who shed his blood to deliver us from the bondage of sin. Boaz is a type of Christ. What he does in this book is what Jesus did for us. Boaz redeems Ruth and Naomi. Jesus Christ redeems us. And we'll talk what all that means. So, so we got Naomi, a mother-in-law, a Jewish lady who trusts God. You got Ruth, a Gentile who trusts in the God of Israel. And you got Boaz, a relative who is the foreshadow of Jesus Christ. Let me give you an outline, okay? There's the first part of the book. Naomi and Ruth, they go to Moab and everything goes wrong and they come back to Bethlehem. We see Ruth going into the fields and she meets Boaz. Then the next chapter, we're just going fast through this. We'll go more details. Then we find Ruth waiting. Guess what? Ruth proposes to Boaz. Is that the way it's supposed to be? We'll see what happens. And we'll see what Boaz answers, and then we see Ruth's marriage. Now, if you have this card, I hope you picked it up when you came in. On one side of the card, it has this outline for you. So as you do your own study over these next three to four to five weeks, you can look at this outline. But on this other side, it actually tells the date, the theme, the key verses, and kind of the overview of the book. So what I would do is I, you know, just put it in your book, and then as you're studying Ruth, you've got all this information. If you didn't get one a card, they're out at all the tables, and, and we'll have them for you. If you want to get more, get Plenty, we got plenty of these cards, so be sure and pick one of those up. Let me give you the flow. A man and a woman have two sons. A famine comes in their land. They leave and go to Moab. The husband dies. The two sons marry Gentile girls instead of Jewish girls. And then they die. And then the mother-in-law, Naomi, takes these Jewish girls, and she's going to go back. I mean, she takes these Gentile girls. One of them stays, and one of them goes, and the one that goes is Ruth. And Ruth comes back, and they meet a man named Boaz who's going to redeem them and protect them. That's the book. It's a love story. 
we say oh, a lot of people like guys will go ah, it's a chick flick right that's what it is it's uh we, yeah tell me when we get to some war you know let's uh, there's plenty of war the girls are going oh i love love stories and guys go I, uh, but let me tell you the reason there's love stories in here because god god's whole plan of redemption and god's story of the bible is a love story it is god who loved the world that he gave his son and God redeems us and saves us through Jesus Christ. And so when we look at a love story like this, you say, why did God put this in the Bible? Because this is a foreshadow of what he does for us through Jesus Christ. Let me give you some things to understand about the Jewish aspects found in this book. This is the first thing called the Leverett Law of Marriage. And remember I told you a while ago that if a brother gets married and you're the next brother in line and he's married and he dies before they have any kids... His responsibility to this next brother down is to marry her. So that's why when your older brother got married, you checked her out, right? Because you said, please don't die. I don't, don't die. Or, or you might say, well, please die, you know, because who knows. But anyway, if, if she, he were to die without children, it was your responsibility. Leverett law of marriage, okay? There's a thing called the law of gleaning. You know, when you talk, look in the Bible, you don't see welfare, but you actually do. Because if you were poor and you didn't have land and you didn't have any way to make a living, you could go into somebody else's land and they were never to harvest the corners of their, of their land so that poor people could come and get whatever's there. And then sometimes when they were harvesting, poor people could walk behind and get whatever was dropped and get to keep it. That was the way they took care of poor people. It's called the law of gleaning. And then the third thing to remember in this book is what we call the guile. Sometimes it's pronounced, spelled G-O-E-L, sometimes G-A-A-L. It's just according to how you want to look at it in Hebrew. <clears throat> but it's the kinsman redeemer. And we're going to talk more about him as we go into the details. But this is the relative who could redeem. This is the relative who could protect. And we'll see it when we get to it. Okay? Number four. Big truths found in a book. Key things to know. Okay? A. Is there an A? Yeah, okay. The book as a whole is a picture of God's love story. That's what it is, love story of redemption. As Boaz loves Ruth and redeems them, we're going to see God does the same thing for us. B, that Boaz is a picture of Jesus Christ. He's the kinsman redeemer just as Jesus is our... Jesus is our Gael, by the way. He's our Goel. He's our kinsman redeemer. And as we look in the book and we get to this part, I'm going to show you how what a kinsman redeemer had to do and we're going to see Jesus did exactly the same thing. And we'll see how that fits together. The third thing, which is the place of the Gentiles in a Jewish book. If you, if you think about it, oftentimes we have this conception that God, at a point in time, chose Abraham and became the first Jew. And he said, I'm going to pick the Jewish people, and they're my people. And from Abraham to Isaac, and Isaac to Jacob, and Jacob on down. And the Jewish people are God's people. And Gentiles, I don't really care that much about them. And that's not true. God loves everybody. He chose the Jewish people, and their responsibility was to proclaim the message of salvation to Gentile people. And, but when we look at this, sometimes Jews and Gentiles at this time, and even in the beginning of the church when we studied the book of Acts, they didn't always get along. And we're going to find that here is a Moabite woman, a Gentile, which normal Jewish people would say, I don't really have anything to do with Moabite, especially Moabite women. We're going to see what happens and how this ties together. The next thing, the lineage of King David. We're going to see his background. Because if you're going to be king, you've got to come through the tribe of Judah. And we're going to see who the lineage of David, King David is. And as I said a while ago, that, that Ruth is the great-grandmother of King David. Who would have ever thought that? By the way, do you realize that in the lineage of Jesus Christ, there are four women? And two of them are bad. Two of them, one of them was a prostitute, and the other pretended to be a prostitute to have sex with someone. I mean, th this is in the lineage of our Savior. You know what God says? Listen, I love all people. And it, all these people come together so that I'm the Savior of the world. It's just it's amazing. We're going to see it. The last thing is the, the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God is seen throughout the whole book. 
I love chapter 2 when it says that Ruth just so happened to go into the field of Boaz. She didn't just so happen to go into the field of Boaz. God's plan was for Ruth to go into the field of Boaz, and we'll see it as we go through it. Let me give you sort of um, an outline based on places. Look at this. We're going to start off in the land of Boaz. Then we're going to go in chapter 2 in the fields. And then in chapter 3, we're going to be at the threshing floor. And then in chapter 4, we're going to be at the city. All four of those tie together. They're four key places, and we'll see how it, how it works. Well, let's quickly look at the first five verses of this book. I hope you've got an understanding. You've got the handout right here that if you want to, and you said, I can't remember anything he said, we'll just read this stuff right here, and it's got a lot of information about it, and we'll see it as we go through the book. Well, let's start. Ruth chapter 1, look at verse 1. Now, it came about in the days when the judges governed that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the land of Moab with his wife and two sons. Now, the writer of Ruth, we don't even know who wrote it, but starts off by saying this. This all happened in the days when the judges governed. Now, remember the judges were these things called sophertine. They were leaders, and they were helping the Jewish people who would turn away from God, and then God would have let them be conquered by somebody, and then they would come and have a victory. And these judges, Gideon was a judge. Deborah and Barak were judges. Samson was a judge. Okay? So these were judges that God raised up to defeat enemies. At the time the judges ruled, it was not a good time. If you've got, if your Bible is like mine, the very last of Judges is on the page right by mine. If not, turn to the very last chapter of the book of Judges, which is the one right beside you, and look at Judges 21, verse 25. It's right beside you. It, it's normally to your left, okay? <laughs> Judges 21, 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own that's the time of the judges. So when this book takes place, when a whole bunch of people are saying, we do what we want to do. We live the way we want to live. We do our own thing. Now, it, it, the, look what it says. Now, in the days, it, it came about when the days when the judges were governed, there was a famine in the land. Why was there a famine in the land? Have you ever thought about that? There's a famine because the nation of Israel turned away from God. Most likely this took place during the time of Gideon, which is Judges chapter 6. And at the time of Gideon, there was a famine. And God stopped the food for his people because they were in open rebellion against him. And so this book starts off and says, it came about when the judges governed, there was this famine in the land. And look what it says. There was this man of Bethlehem in Judah who went to sojourn, went to live in the land of Moab with his wife and two sons. Now, when you think of Bethlehem, what do you think of? You think of Christmas, you think of birth of Jesus. Exactly, because Bethlehem is basically, this, you're going to see this is the background in the family of, of Jesus, of King David. And Jesus is a descendant of King David. So Bethlehem. Now, let me show you something. Bethlehem comes from two Hebrew words, Abayat, Lahem. Bayat means house, Lahem means bread. Bethlehem means the house of bread. Judah means praise. It says there was this man who, who a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah, Judah is the province, he decided to leave Bethlehem and to go into the land of Moab with his wife and two kids. You realize that in the house of bread, there's no bread. And in the place of praise, there's no praise because they're, in, they're sin in the nation and God is disciplining his people. It says that he's going to sojourn in the land. Sojourn means to go for a short time. Sojourn means go like, ah, oh, we're going to go over there for a little bit, we're going to stay, and then we're going to come back. If you'd have said, to, if, if you could have talked to this man, his name is Elimelech, if you could have talked to him and said, how long are you going to stay over there? He'd say, oh. Oh, a couple of months. We're, we're, we just have, to have a famine here, and I heard, I heard there may be some food in Moab. So we're, I'm going to move my family over to Moab searching for some food. How long do you think you'll stay there? Oh, not a very long time at all. Well, let's see where this Moab is, okay? Uh, go ahead, next slide. The nation of Israel, this is where Bethlehem is. This is Jerusalem, and this is the region called Moab. And there's, there's Ammon, Moab, and Edom. Edom's way down there. It's not on the map. That's three people groups. So this is the Ammonites. And by the way, the capital city of, jo of Jordan. Does anybody know the capital city of Jordan? 
It's Ammon, Jordan. These were called the Ammonites. That's where, the, that's where they get the title of the capital of, the, of Jordan. It's Ammon, Jordan. These were the Ammonites. These were the Moabites. And way down here, under the curtain, is the Edomites. Okay? He left Bethlehem. You don't go this way to go around there. You go across this way, across by Jericho, and then you come down. He decided he would go live where the Moabites lived. Probably he heard there was food there. Okay, so he takes his family and they leave. Moab, I think the next slide says it, Moab means empty. That's what it means. He's going from the place, he's going from the house of bread to a place of emptiness. And see, Moab is a picture of the world. And that's what people do all the time. We leave the truths of God's word and we go out and see if we can find something in the world. They leave the promised land and to go into the world. And let me tell you, we can't do that. The only place that we're going to find any satisfaction is with our Savior, Jesus Christ. Philippians 4, 6 says, Be anxious for nothing but everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. What? Let your request be made known to God. Don't look to the world to meet your needs. Look to Jesus Christ. Well, notice. And, and I, I'll tell you what. I, I don't want to go into the details on who the Moabites are, but I want you to write this down. Genesis chapter 19. Go look it up and see where the Moabites came from. They came from Lot. That's Abraham's nephew. Look it up, because it's not very good. I don't want to even talk about it. So you can go look in Genesis chapter 19, okay? Now, let's look at verse 2. Let's see what happens. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi, and the name of his two sons were Malon and Chilon, Ephraimites of Bethlehem and Judah. Now, they entered the land of Moab and remained there. Now, let me tell you something. Look right here. His name is Elimelech. Eli the first part is Eli. Eli Melech is what it really is. Elimelech. Eli means my God. My God. And Melech is, means king. Elimelech means my God is king. That's his name. Naomi means sweet or joy. Malon, let me tell you, every place we look up, it looks like Malon means sick and Kailon means weak. Now, would you name your boys weak and, weak and sick? <laughs> but we can't find any other things of what this means. So uh, maybe they, when they were born, they were just little weak little things, and they said, well, just, just call them that. Uh, a lot of times they waited until people got a little older before they actually named them. But anyway, that's their names. So it's really great to go through the rest of your life being known as sick and weak. But that's who they are. Anyway, it says the name of the man was Elimelech. The name of his wife was Naomi. Their sons were Malon and Kailon, and they were from Bethlehem and Judah. By the way, there are two Bethlehems. There's a Bethlehem in the northern part of Israel, and there's a Bethlehem in the southern part of Israel. The Bethlehem in the southern part of Israel is called Bethlehem in Judea. That's where Jesus was born. That's this family. It's in the southern part. Now, it says that they remained in the land. They came to Moab and remained there. Were they just going to go for a short time? Is that right? You know how long they stayed? Verse, 10, uh, verse 4 says they stayed 10 years. Is that a short time? That's not a short time. Because, see, it's a picture of, of looking to the world. It's a picture of, of going into sin. Because let me tell you, it always fools you. Let me show you something. Sin always fools us. It'll always take you further. It'll keep you longer. It'll cost you more. When you say, I'm going to do something. I know it's wrong, but I'm going to do it. I'm only going to do it this one time. No, you're going to do it more than one time. And before you know it, it's taking you further than you thought. And it's going to keep you there longer than you thought. It's going to cost you more than you thought. So sin always fools us. They thought we're just going to go into emptiness, Moab, for a short time. And then we'll come back. And it kept them longer than they ever thought. And they were there for 10 years years. But notice what happened. Verse 3. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. Now, in the Bible, there's something called a widow and a widow indeed. A widow means that you've lost your husband, but you still have family. A widow indeed is you've lost your husband, and you don't have any family. At this stage, Naomi is a widow. She's lost her husband, but she's still got her boys. Okay? But look what happens. Verse 4. They took for themselves Moabite women as wives. The name of one was Orphan, the other name was Ruth, and they lived there about 10 years. Deuteronomy 23 tells us that they're not supposed to really marry outside of their Jewish faith. Not supposed to. But they did. Now, you notice that they didn't marry these women until their what? Until their daddy died. I don't think he would have let them marry. But now you've got this mother... And they, they say to Mama, look, we found these girls, and we like them. 
and we're going to marry him. And she can't say, I'm going to call your father. He's gone. So they marry these two Moabite girls. And when you look at it, we'd say, they, they're not supposed to do that. They shouldn't have. And notice, they stay there 10 years. But we're not through. Look what happens. Then both Mylon and Kylon also died. And the woman was bereft of her two children and her husband. What happened to Naomi? She goes out with her husband. Now let me tell you, she didn't decide to go. Elimelech decided to go. Her responsibility as a wife was wherever he said to go, we're going. He said, we're going to Moab. She goes to Moab. She goes out with a husband and two sons. And in 10 years, she loses a husband and two sons. And she ends up with two non-Jewish women, daughters-in-law. Think about it. Oh, go ahead. I think we've already talked through that, haven't we? Yeah. She's a widow. She has no sons to carry on the name. And she's, she has Gentile daughter-in-laws. Listen, she has nobody to carry on her name. She has nobody to protect her. In that day and time, a widow had no one to protect them. She can't say, I'll call my husband. She can't say, I'll call my sons. The sons aren't even there. They're gone. Everybody's gone. And who does she have? She has two non-Jewish daughter-in-laws. She doesn't want to go back to Israel and go, I'd like you to meet my two non-Jewish daughter-in-laws. It's an embarrassment to her. So she says, I went out full. I'm going back empty. I thought life was good. It's been bad. I lost my husband. I lost my kids. And I got two non-Jewish girls. I don't know what to do with these women. And how are we going to make a living? We don't have anything. They left the house of bread and went into emptiness. And they came up empty. They're outside the land. They've intermarried with the Moabites. There's three deaths. What's going to happen to this woman and her two Gentile daughters-in-law? We're going to see that God's going to take one of them and bring them back. And this one, Ruth, is going to be the great-grandmother of King David. And we'll see how that fits. What well, we've seen this morning, the book of Ruth and love and redemption. We've seen Elimelech where he leaves and he goes into Moab and he comes up empty and he dies. And then the sons die and they end up being, uh, they get married. And then the sons die and they end up being there for 10 years. So let me give you some applications. First of all, realize that God's redemption is a love story. It really is. The whole story of the Bible is a love story. I think I've got John 3.16. God so loved the world. That's the story of the Bible. I tell people all the time the story of the Bible is how the perfect God brings sinful man back to himself using his son, Jesus Christ. But he so loved us, he brought us back to himself. You know, when mankind sinned and failed, God could have said, well, there you go. Have a great life. All of you are going to all be dead and separated. That's what's going to happen. But that's not what he did. He so loved us, he sent his son to give us eternal life by faith. God loves us. That's the story of the Bible. Second Corinthians, God has sent his son to reconcile man to himself. And let me remind you of something, that salvation is in a person. It is the person of Jesus Christ. Salvation is not in church, not in actions, not in our goodness, not in our righteousness, not anything that we do. Salvation is in Jesus Christ. We put our faith in Jesus Christ for eternal life. God's story is a love story. So we trust in Christ. Second, don't look to the world for peace and security because you'll always find emptiness. The world is empty. The world is empty. Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. If you want peace, it comes from God. Everything in the world is temporary. And it's empty. I, many of you may not remember this. Some, a lot of you who are older will remember uh, O.J. Simpson and all of the stuff and the trials and the murder trial and him ending up in prison. He's in prison now. Some of you don't even know who O.J. Simpson was. He was a great football player. He played at USC. He was a pro football player. He was an actor. He was everything. He had the top of the world. He had a beautiful wife. He had everything. 
And I remember seeing an interview before O.J. Simpson got into trouble because he was accused of murdering his wife and he was found not guilty, but although most people think he did kill his wife and another person, and he ended up in prison uh, by stealing something and threatening somebody, so he's been in prison for a while. But he was on top of the world, and I remember seeing an interview with O.J. Simpson on top of the world. He's, he was in the pro, well, I don't know if he was uh, still in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, but he was one of the greatest college players of all time, one of the great pro football players of all time, a movie actor. He was everything, and they said, O.J., you're on top of the world and he said my life is empty there's got to be more than this and let me tell you something if you go after anything other than the truths of the Bible and Jesus Christ and life and all, if you go after anything else you're going to find that it's empty because the world can never satisfy things can never satisfy they just you get a thing it breaks and you got to get another thing and nothing things will never satisfy so don't look to the world for peace and security. The only peace and security you're going to ever have is through Jesus Christ. The world has nothing to offer. Jesus Christ has eternal life. Third thing, sin will fool us. We think it's going to be temporary. Just like if you'd have said to Elimelech, should you stay in the land? You know what the answer was? Yes, don't leave the land of Israel. It's the promised land. But he went to Moab. And he said, I won't be gone, but just a little while. I'll only stay just a little while and we'll come back. But it took him further and cost him more than he could imagine. And that's what sin does for us. It always takes us further. It always lasts longer. And it always costs us more. So be real careful. Once you start into something, there's no telling what can happen. And that's why whenever you sin, confess it and forsake it. So may we realize God's love for us in redemption. May we look to Jesus Christ as the only source of salvation and peace. And may we study the book of Ruth and gain some great truths as we make application.